Hello and welcome to the Trinity Fit Over 40 podcast with me, Rob Burkhead. And me, Ben Hughes. We are the co-founders of Trinity Transformation and creators of the Fit Over 40 method. And for more information about what we do, go to www.fit40info.com. So in today's episode, we're going to reveal the best winter meals for women over 40. So sit back and relax and welcome to today's podcast. One of the most common questions we get asked, especially around this time of year, about how to lose weight for women over 40 is what are the best foods to eat in winter as a woman over 40? We have worked with so many women in their 40s and 50s who felt stuck because they didn't know what they should be eating over winter to get the scales moving and to achieve their goals. Those summer dishes just didn't seem so appealing anymore. And instead they were turning to kind of winter comfort foods, so things they were sort of used to. But then they would step on the scales and see zero movement or maybe even be heavy than they were before. And when you're not seeing results, it is very, very hard to stay motivated, which is why a lot of women end up kind of giving up until January, just giving into the comfort foods, the Christmas foods, everything that comes along with winter and just being feeling completely stuck and unable to get their weight under control during this period. Choosing their clothes to cover up problem areas rather than wearing the things they like. Hating shopping for clothes because nothing fits quite right anymore, especially in the more trendy shops. And staring at a wardrobe full of amazing clothes they can no longer wear. And worrying that this might just be part of the aging process that they'll just have to get used to and accept. And the reason that this happens is simple. Women's bodies and hormones start to change as they get older, which can make it easier to gain weight, especially around the middle and harder to lose it again with the kind of normal methods of exercise and normal methods of nutrition. But if you have the right nutrition approach, if you also know the right winter food choices, ones that are designed to work for women over 40, you can quickly and easily get the scales moving and drop two stone in as little as 12 weeks. So in today's podcast, we're going to reveal the best winter foods to eat for women over 40 so you can do exactly that. Awesome. So let's get straight into it. So for the women we work with, who are usually very busy and whose bodies and hormones have changed since turning 40, the meals that they eat, they usually need to be the following three things if they want to be able to lose weight quickly and easily and they want it to fit around their lifestyle, which is obviously really important as well. So the first thing it needs to do is just to be quick and easy. So it doesn't take up loads of time. It doesn't mean they have to do loads of extra stuff beyond what they're doing already. And it fits around a hectic schedule, you know, back-to-back meetings all day, finishing work relatively late maybe, not got loads of time and energy to dedicate to it. And then you may have to look after children or aging parents. That's very typical for the people we work with. So it needs to be quick and easy. That's the first thing. Second thing needs to hit what we call the key three in terms of your nutrition. So not too many calories, first of all, not too many, but also not too little, because actually that can also cause problems um, with hormones and disrupt cortisol and stop you seeing results. Needs to be enough protein because one of the main problems the women we work with have is they don't have much muscle and they're losing muscle as they get older because they're not doing the right things. And that makes them flabby. It makes things like their bum saggy, their their bingo wings get worse. Um, And also their metabolism slows down because they don't have much muscle. So there needs to be enough protein to counteract all of that. And then there needs to be plenty of fiber as well. And if you have enough protein, enough fiber, what that will do is that will fill you up for way longer. So you won't get really bad cravings and be tempted to to overeat things like biscuits and crisps and loads of unhealthy snacks. So the meals need to hit those three three things. We call the key three, right amount of calories, protein and fiber. And then the last thing it needs to do is to avoid what we call the hormone disrupting foods. So these are what we call the WADS foods, which stands for WADS, stands for wheat, alcohol, dairy and sugar and these are foods that disrupt women's hormones as they get older as they approach menopause which can be these changes in hormones can start to happen up to 10 years before clinical menopause often for women in the early 40s and can keep going for many many years after that as well so we want to avoid having too much wheat alcohol dairy or sugar so we generally say avoid that 80 percent of the time if you want to be able to get good results and that overall approach we just talked about there Um, that we do in our programs called hormonally balanced eating. So all of the recommendations we're going to give you today are going to make sure they kind of are in line with that hormonally balanced eating approach, which means our clients are able to lose one to two stone every 12 weeks, even in the run up to winter. And we've even got some um, some results we'll share at the end for people who achieved that. But first of all, what we're going to do is go through kind of what are the sort of poorer bad choices, the ones you want to avoid, which are winter kind of typical winter things people do eat. And then we'll go into some good choices. So Ben, I'll let you kick off with some of the bad choices that we think people should avoid, what we know people should avoid if they want to lose weight as a woman over 40. 
So when it comes to winter comfort foods, they're not all made equal. Some are much worse than others. But the good news is, we'll go through in a minute, there are loads and loads of good choices which are healthy, not only healthy, but also they they do the job as a winter comfort food. They're also very delicious. They kind of hit the spot. But the things to avoid, um, number one is pasta-based dishes. So any dish that's sort of based around pasta, again, there actually is a, a an alternative to this coming up, but pasta-based dishes, based dishes things like pasta bakes things like lasagna anything like that cannelloni is that the uh, they're the tubes aren't they mm. um and any other sort of pasta based dishes tend to not be great pasta is essentially it's a wheat based thing it's very very high in carbs it's it's processed as well so it's not very filling it doesn't contain that much protein it doesn't contain much fiber and it contains a huge amount of calories so it's Eating pasta type dishes is a way to eat tons and tons of calories, which will make you feel sluggish, which might make you feel tired, whilst not actually making you feel full and satisfied. So then even if you eat a massive portion of pasta bake or lasagna, you'll probably be still likely to crave something else afterwards, which is just not ideal if you're trying to uh, keep your weight and keep your food choices under control. The second things to avoid are anything pastry based. So if if you're looking at eating anything and it contains some form of pastry, I would say step away from it, walk away from it. Pastry is super calorie dense. So it's essentially um, like pasta. It's also made, made from wheat. So it's usually made from wheat flour. And then it's got tons and tons of butter in it. So it's really, really calorie dense, buttery, floury. It's almost as if, I mean, if you think about the, the texture of it, it's like you've taken a loaf of bread and then just like squashed it down until it's really dense. That's kind of what, how you get to uh, something like pastry. But anything, so for example, pies, steak and kidney pies, chicken pies, any type of sort of pie like that is not ideal. Uh, things like salmon on croute and I can't remember what the beef one's called now, actually. The beef Wellington. is like a lattice of pastry. That's it. Beef Wellington, toad in the hole, um, big Yorkshire puddings. All of these kind of batter type, pastry type things are things you want to avoid. And of course, as well, the, the same goes for any sort of pastry based sweet thing. We've mainly focused on savory things, but, you know, also apple pies, apple strudel, anything that's sort of pastry based and is also a sweet treat, best avoided. I mean, all of these foods, some of them. So, for example, you know, if you have a steak and kidney pie or a salmon on croute, something like that, it will have a bit of protein in, which is good. Um, what it won't have, it won't have any fiber. It will also be made of pastry, which is wheat based and highly processed. It's also full of absolutely loads of calories so again it's it's not going to sort of fill you up for a long period of time and you're likely to crave more food afterwards the next thing to watch out for is any fattier meat so eating meats generally is good for getting getting in a good amount of protein it tends to be quite filling it tends to be quite satisfying um some form some type meat based things though are very very fatty the problem with them being fatty is that fats are very very calorie dense so foods that contain a lot of fat are extremely calorie dense, meaning that if you eat something like pork belly and you compare that to something like chicken, the pork belly is going to have, you know, two to three times more calories. I don't know the exact amount, but it will be loads because pork belly is a super fatty piece of meat. So any sort of really fatty meat you want to avoid um, or at least have in moderation. The problem with any of these things is let's say you're trying to aim for aim to keep your food intake under control, keep your calorie intake into, uh, under control. So ultimately that's what's going to make the difference between whether you gain weight or whether you lose weight, or whether you maintain your weight. If you choose something like pork belly to, to get the sort of the, the correct amount of calories and the correct amount of um, energy coming in from your food, you'd have to have such a small piece that again, it's not going to be very filling. And then you're going to have to have something else afterwards, or you're going to feel, you're not going to feel full. You're not going to feel satisfied. The problem with any sort of approach where you don't feel full and satisfied is it's very difficult to stick to for, for the long term. So if you can't feel full and satisfied from whatever nutrition approach you're fo following, um, it's very unlikely that you're going to stick to that for a long, long period of time. So fatty meats to avoid things like pork belly, um, fattier cuts of beef or steak. So steaks like ribeye and wagyu steak or beef burgers. Um, you especially want to avoid you'll see a lot of burgers that are sort of like the ultimate burger and they'll have, you know, loads of stuff in them. They'll have, they'll be like super, super juicy, super fatty. Maybe some of them even have like cheese in the middle and things like that. You want to avoid any of those really fatty type of burgers. Um, pork sausages as well are 
usually very very fatty other than things like chicken um, no sorry yeah chicken sausages can be a bit leaner um but generally you want to avoid those fatty meats when it comes to things like fish um there are fattier fish the thing with those is they they also tend to contain quite a lot of sort of healthy fats so the omega-3 fish oils that come in them so things like mackerel and salmon for example those are they're good from a health point of view but if you're trying to keep calories low it's often better to go for sort of lower calorie alternatives like the white fish hot cod haddock etc tends to be better and we'll talk about in a minute the different um different sort of leaner meats that you can go through rather go for rather than the fattier cuts and the final thing to avoid would be any type of sort of saucy takeaway so you definitely want to avoid chinese food which usually uh, all the sauces are made of either uh, lots of oil and lots of sugar it tends to be and saucy indian dishes which usually are made with lots of cream lots of butter lots of oil in sauces I've definitely had before when when I ordered a, an Indian takeaway and you open the takeaway container and there's like literally a, a sort of layer of grease floating over the top of the curry as it's almost separated out. And you've got like half a centimeter of just pure oil on the top of it. So those sauces that are full of oil, again, fatty foods are very, very, um, very, very calorie dense. So they can just push your calories over massively. And then other things to avoid you'll probably know all the other things that you should avoid. It's it's anything where you really know it's something unhealthy. So if you're going out and getting fish and chips or a kebab or you're ordering Domino's pizza or you're having like chips or crisps or chocolate, you ultimately know <laughs> all of the rest of the things that you need to avoid. But the four things that the sort of winter comfort foods that you, that you need to stay away from, pasta-based dishes, we would say, pastry-based dishes, really fatty cuts of meat and saucy takeaways and now rob is going to go through what you should have instead what are the good winter comfort foods that you can stick to yeah so we're going to focus mainly on kind of the main meals because we could do a whole other episode i think on desserts um alone so maybe we'll do that as a demand but let's focus on the main meals so the first one we would really recommend which is still a really nice winter warmer i think is like a lean stew so a chicken casserole or like a venison casserole. The reason these are better is because these are much leaner cuts of meat. So like Ben said, anything that contains a lot of fat, their fat isn't always bad for you, but it is calorie dense. And like your car, it runs on oil, on petrol. It runs on that because it's very, well, you might have an electric one now, but most cars were oil and petrol. The reason it runs on that is because it's very high in energy for the like the amount of kind of weight it has and it's the same with fat it's very high in energy if you sat at your desk all day you don't need all of this fat coming in so if you make a few like clever switches so you like go for a chicken casserole and use chicken breast not chicken thighs which a lot of people don't realize are quite different chicken thighs are much fattier there's about 25 percent more calories and 25 percent more fat in chicken thighs that's why they're higher in calories and I know maybe some people think it's slightly tastier, but again, it's about weighing up the options of what you want more. Do you want to look and feel amazing or do you want to have a slightly tastier casserole? Whereas I think you can still make a really good chicken breast one as long as you don't overcook it and dry it out. Fill those casseroles with loads of root veg as well. So things like carrots and parsnips, especially are really not that high in calories. Also, potatoes aren't too bad, but if you want to keep it lower in calories, if you focus on other root veg, you're going to keep the, cal the calories even lower. So things like carrots, parsnips, butternut squash, it's also a lot lower in calories than potatoes. And you can make a really, really nice casserole and just don't use too much oil in making it. And that will save you loads of calories. Venison, as an alternative to beef, is also really good. It's about 50% less calories than like your typical beef stewing steak, like a sirloin steak. It's about half the calories. So again, you can eat the same amount and it's half the calories and probably just as filling and it will have more protein in it as well. So there's a couple of stew ideas. And then I'll go through a couple of bolognese um, or kind of like alternatives to these pasta dishes that we talked about earlier as well. So what we make a lot of the time, like me and Lucy make a lean bolognese where we use 5% beef mince or we use corn mince, depending on our inclination that week. Um, and we put loads of veg in it. So if you've got young children, this is a really good way of disguising the veg. So we'll get loads of veg like aubergine, courgette, <clears> um, <throat> onions, obviously, carrots, maybe celery, 
chop it all up and then we put it in our mini chopper like a mini food processor usually in a few goes there's almost no calories in that veg but there's loads of fiber so like when we we're talking about the key three earlier we're saying you want to have loads of fiber that will fill you up and it also get you loads of vitamins and minerals in there um the reason it fills you up is because it digests slowly fiber same as protein um so then the energy is released slowly it's like drip fed into your system rather than the energy hits you all at once like if you eat a really sugary dish or processed dish so you want to chop up loads of veg. We just fry that. And again, minimal oil, just cook that down, add the beef mince or corn, you know, chopped tomatoes, again, are pretty low in calories. And then you can make a really delicious dish without needing to load it with fat, fatty cuts of, of mince because typical beef mince is 20% fat. It's a lot higher in calories. Also, to then keep the calories even lower, but still make it delicious, you can use courgette. So courgette instead of spaghetti so you're not having that wheat as we talked about with the like hormone disrupting foods instead you have courgette which is again a vegetable you make it from courgette and you turn it into courgette spaghetti hence courgette um they also call it zoodles in america because they call it zucchini noodles um but you just get a spiralizer and you you kind of it's like a pencil sharpener almost it turns that courgette into spaghetti ribbons you can either eat it raw or you can like fry it in a tiny bit of spray oil for a couple of minutes and when it's mixed with the bolognese, you don't really notice the difference. We do this quite often. If you really want to have some pasta, you can always make pasta for the rest of the family and courgette for you, or you can do 50 50. So you can do courgette, that courgette spaghetti, mix it into the pasta, and then it still reduces the calories a lot. If you have courgette rather than spaghetti, it's about five times less calories. So the reason I think this is great is whenever I've been trying to get leaner and, and cut down on my food intake, I will have loads of courgette because I'm in a massive portion. And instead of it being 500 calories of spaghetti, it's 100 or less calories of courgette. Even with a bit of spray oil, it's like 100 or less calories. So it's five times less calories. It's just as filling or more filling. You don't really notice the difference. I know it doesn't sound that nice, but actually it's pretty good. Um, and then it means that you're really full and you don't realize you're eating less calories, which I think is the game we always want to play here, is you want to feel like you're still having the winter comfort foods, but you don't realize it. So there are a couple of ideas, those kind of that lean bolognese, that lean stew. Oh, and I mentioned a lean lasagna as well. We have a really good one in our cookbook that all our members get on our program, which is a courgette based lasagna. We're always getting good feedback about that. So you can use courgette instead of lasagna sheets. And that gets rid of that wheat that we talked about earlier. And Ben mentioned like very calorie dense, um, very processed. Instead, you're replacing it with vegetables. So it's much healthier as well. And it's still really filling. So you're going to get all that fiber in there. Uh, and it does actually work really well. Again, it doesn't sound like it would be amazing. So we have loads of clients go, I didn't know how this would turn out. Actually, it was delicious. It's surprising. There's a couple of good. ideas. Oh, yeah. Go on, ben, say, you made it. It, it. Just every time I've had courgette, I was a I was a doubter initially. I mean, I've, this is years ago. I was like, there's no way. I didn't really like courgette, but I was like, there's no way this can actually replace spaghetti. But by the time you've got the sauce on it and you've got a little bit of Parmesan grated on, it is, it's, it's surprisingly good. It's like it's just as enjoyable almost. Yeah, I wasn't convinced either. Why don't you go through the last couple of ideas we've got as well? So the next one is a homemade soup, which is an excellent way of as well getting rid of leftovers when you've got all those sort of slightly old vegetables in the in the bottom of the fridge. It's a great way of using those things up. Um, you can also boost the protein in the soup that you're having as well, because as we mentioned before, protein is so it's really, really important to feel full and to feel satisfied for two things again. If you have something high in fiber, high in protein, it'll keep you feeling really full and really satisfied. Soup is going to be high in fiber just because vegetables are very, very, they have a lot of fiber in them. So you can make any different type of soup and then you can boost protein with things like peas or things like lentils, things like shredded chicken breast. The other thing that's quite good as well is if you buy the, um, you can buy like ham sort of hock trimmings. You can get them in like Aldi and Lidl. They sell them off for like nothing, like the extra sort of end bits of the ham. If you make, for example, a pea, a pea soup and you have like pea with ham soup, that's actually quite a high protein meal, even though it's a even though it's a soup and it'll be low in calories and high in protein as well. And as well, if you if you make the soup, you make a huge batch of soup from all of your leftover vegetables and then portion it out. You can then freeze those portions and then you've got loads and loads of quick and easy things that you can just grab and and chuck in the microwave and reheat whenever you need. So that's really, really good. The thing to avoid with the soup, though, is having too much bread and butter with it, because that's really what adds the calories to the soup. I guess there's two things that add calories to soup. Number one will be like making cream of something soup. So if you're making like cream of tomato soup where you've got some tomato in it, but actually it's 50% cream, 
it's not going to be ideal in terms of the, the amount of calories and how good it is for you. So I'd recommend make soups that avoid these type of things. I've I've never really made the, the really sort of creamy soups, but even making like, you know, mushroom soups, tomato soups, etc. You can make them really good just with like, just with vegetables, essentially. So when you look at what recipe to use for the soup, just find one that doesn't have loads of cream and butter and so things like that in it. And then the final one is Christmas dinner is on a good choice for a winter warming meal. You can also substitute this for a Sunday roast can be good as well. So there are good things that are on it. The, the best things that are on the Christmas dinner tend to be the fact that you're having turkey or you're having chicken, chicken breast. As Rob mentioned before, the thigh meat is about 25% more calories and fat than, than the breast meat. So if you're trying to get the most protein and the most food for your calories, stick to the leaner breast cuts of meat. Um, so if you have turkey and chicken breast, any boiled and steamed veg, literally all vegetables are low in calories, high in fiber, um, very filling. So have us literally fill. If you put start with the protein, put some protein on your plate, fill most of the rest of the plate with vegetables. Then on the side of it with the turkey or the chicken, have a bit of cranberry sauce. It's a little bit sugary, but you because you're not having such a small amount, it's not really going to add much in terms of calories. And then the things to watch out for, especially on Christmas dinner, are pigs in blankets. With your normal Sunday roast, you're probably not going to have pigs in blankets, I would imagine, unless you're very, uh, very decadent in your household, more than me. Um, so you, pigs in blankets, when you have the Christmas dinner, if you have like, you know, have one or two, have a couple of them, just taste them, but don't don't make those like the main focus of the meal. Um, fattier cuts of meat as well, that's something to watch out for. So if you're having a roast for example, you're having a roast with lamb instead. Lamb tends to be very, very fatty compared to chicken or turkey. If you were having a roast with um, pork as well. So I, I don't know if you, people don't usually own oh, like a pork crackling joint. So if you've done like a pork crackling joint, and you have a massive piece of crackling that comes under the uh, fatty meats cat category as well. Um, stuffing is another thing to watch out for. Me and Rob have had to look up how these things are made because it's not. I've never actually made stuffing from scratch. I usually just buy it in a packet, but essentially it's uh, made of bread and butter put together. Bread sauce is another one to watch out for, which is breadcrumbs, milk, cream, and butter, which in from sort of a calories and nutrition standpoint, couldn't really be much worse, I don't think. Um, so as long as you keep sort of those things under control, roast potatoes as well, have a couple with like the pigs and blankets, have a couple, but don't have loads. So the key with these things is you have like a couple of pigs and blankets, a couple of roast potatoes, absolutely loads of veg, and then loads of meat. Then you'll have a Sunday roast or a Christmas dinner that is very, very good nutritionally. But the thing is, when it, when it comes to the actual Christmas dinner, the reality is it is only one meal, one meal a year as well. So we recommend all of our clients take Christmas Day and take Boxing Day off completely and just enjoy whatever you want. You know, have a few glasses of wine, enjoy your Christmas dinner have a few chocolates and mince pies and things like that. But then as soon as you've got got that day over and done with, get back on track, get back to normal, check back in with your coach and, and start back on your journey. Because I mean, the reality is one unhealthy meal or one couple of unhealthy days out of the year isn't going to make a huge difference. It's not going to undo all your progress. However, if you have, a, if you have Christmas dinner, and then in the lean, the lead up to it, you've been eating um, like pork belly, takeaways, pasta bake lasagna pies toad in the hole if you it's when you start getting into the habit of having these type of unhealthy winter comfort foods day in day out that you can push your calories way over where they need to be you're eating you know one and a half two times the amount of food that you're you actually need to take in that then over the christmas period over the winter you can go through and you can end up a stone or more heavier than you want to be just through kind of the food choices you make it so I'll just recap those good choices again. So the things to aim for, lean stews, so chicken casserole, venison casserole, add lots and lots of root vegetables in there. Things like lean bolognese or courgette lasagna. So 5% beef mince uh, or corn. Use that courgette rather than spaghetti. The next one is homemade soups. So use loads and loads of veg. Boost the protein with things like peas, lentils, shredded chicken breast. Avoid bread and butter. And then Christmas dinner, Again, aim for the high protein. So go for the go for those lean meats, loads and loads of boiled veg, 
and then a small amount of the delicious tasty extra bits awesome so the last thing I want to say on that before we share some results of, of, a, of one of our clients who've achieved great results over winter, just because I want to show it is possible. We've got loads like this is really what Ben's saying. This is about quality rather than you don't have to cut back on quantity. It's not about having to not eat or starve yourself over winter. It's about just making better choices. And then you can still eat. These can still be relatively big portions. They'll still fill you up. And you'll still be able to see really good results. So it's not about missing out. It's just about working with you and you're changing body and you're changing hormones and making some smarter choices. And that's literally what our whole approach about is about. It's not about doing more or eating, you know, having to cut back loads on your food or having to do loads more exercise. It's just about doing the right versions of those things. And actually, you can see really good results without having to make it miserable for yourself. So this testimony was from Trinity member. Um, Lisa, who sent this on 28th of December last year. So I went through our testimonials from last year and was looking at the Christmas ones. And there's loads of good ones, but this is one I just kind of stood out. So I wanted to share this with you from around the Christmas period. So this is from three days after Christmas Day. And she said, before joining Trinity three months ago, I was 91 kilos and a size 16. I hated that nothing fitted. I hated the way I looked on Zoom meetings. I hated my big thighs. I had no energy and I wanted to be fitter and slimmer and to be able to do more with the kids. I tried Oral snap medication, excess medical tablets, diuretics, taking more thyroxine than I should, all the low calorie diets, oh, so many things. I'd also tried walking in the odd gym class, but I couldn't do too many classes. It would drain me after a few weeks. And now I know that it's because I didn't have the muscles to keep up the cardio. Now, I was very skeptical before joining. Nothing else had previously worked. So why would this, I thought. But I like that if it didn't work, I would get my money back. So I might as well give it a try. And I'm so glad I did. In the last three months, I've already lost five kilos, which is just under a stone, and I'm amazed. I'm totally in size 14 for dresses and skirts and the odd size 12 too. I have more energy and want to go out more. All my clothes fit better, and they're even too big. I also feel more confident and ask for what I want as part of a promotion at work rather than accepting what they offered. So incredible changes there for Lisa. Not only she lost nearly a stone in the three months before Christmas, but she also dropped between one and two dress sizes. She's in 14s and 12s rather than 16s. Again, all in the run up to Christmas and without having to miss out on everything. So Ben, where can people go if they're kind of interested in achieving results like Lisa? So if you want to find out more about how to achieve results like Lisa, if you head to www.fit40info.com, you can find all the information that you need on that page. Awesome. So that just about wraps it up for today's episode of the Fit Over 40 podcast. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again next week for another episode. We'll see you then.